Bernanke is the chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, better known as the Fed. The Federal Reserve controls the economy by setting interest rates, but after the crash of 08, Bernanke invoked emergency powers and with unprecedented aggressiveness, he's thrown a trillion dollars at the crisis. Bernanke cut interest rates nearly to zero. Then he used Depression-era emergency powers to launch a dozen rescue programs of his own. There was support for money market funds, mortgages, short-term lending to small businesses, and support for auto loans, student loans, and small business loans. Commitments of a trillion dollars, doubling the size of the Fed's balance sheet. Is that tax money that the Fed is spending? It's not tax money. The banks have um, accounts with the Fed much the same way that you have an account in a commercial bank. So to lend to a bank, we simply use the computer to mark up the uh, size of the account that they have with the Fed. So it's much more akin, uh, although not exactly the same, but it's much more akin to printing money than it is to borrowing. You've been printing money. Well, effectively, and we need to do that because our economy is very weak and inflation is very low. When the economy begins to recover, that'll be the time that we need to unwind those programs, uh, raise interest rates, reduce the money supply, and make sure that we have a recovery that does not involve inflation. He's not kidding about printing money. The Fed issues U.S. currency. That's why it says Federal Reserve Note on all the bills in your wallet. This is the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, just a few blocks from Bernanke's office. The Fed's mandate from Congress is to put enough money in the system for maximum employment, but not so much that it sets off inflation. Thanks to Warren Mosler again for the following heuristic. This uh, allegory is expanded upon by Professor Bill Mitchell on his blog, and you can see the link to that blog in the video description below. Warren Mosler starts this example by saying, here's how you can turn litter into currency. He picks up his business card. Here's mine. He says, does anybody want a job that pays in my business cards? I hope you have enough sense not to take it because they are worth nothing. You can check eBay. These business cards are valueless. Since they're worthless, I can't hire anybody with them. I can't use this as a currency to pay you to work for me. It's not worth anything. I can't hire anybody with these. I can't use these to get my employees to do things for me and to provision me with goods and services. This is just a worthless bit of paper. But there's one more thing. When you go to leave the room, there's a guy at the door and he's got a big stick. And the only way that you can get past him is to pay the tax of one business card. Now you're all unemployed. Now you need to find a way to get these in order to leave without getting hit on the head with a big stick. So if you use Australian dollars, we're not talking about a big stick, but we're talking about a police force and a court system and a tax collector. And they will take your house. They will put you in prison if you don't pay the tax in Australian dollars. So until you get this, you can never leave the room. You can't pay your tax until I spend it. Otherwise, where are you going to find these business cards? You can't print your own business cards at home that's counterfeiting. Until I spend my business card into the economy, there isn't any way to get these cards. And if you do try and print your own, you're counterfeiting. And I know you're counterfeiting because of my special insignia. So now I offer you all the job and I say, if you stay afterwards for 10 minutes and help me clean up the room, then I will pay you one business card for working for 10 minutes. Now I, the government can spend these otherwise worthless cards because you need them to pay the tax to get out of the room. I can issue more of my business card whenever I like. If you print your own business cards with your name on it, I won't accept it for payment of the tax. So let's say there's 10 people in the room and I decide I'm only going to spend nine cards. One person will always be without work. If there's 10 of you and you each need one card to leave and I only give nine cards out, I only offer nine jobs that pay in cards, there will be involuntary unemployment, no matter what. Let me show you something else. Do you see the back of this card? There's no gold behind it. But you're willing to work for it, even though there's no gold behind it. There's nothing backing this up. It's just a bit of paper. You're willing to work for it because you need it to pay the tax. In Australia, if you don't pay your government fees, fines and taxes in Australian dollars, then the tax office will issue you with a big fine. 
and the fine will be denominated in Australian dollars. And if you don't pay it, they can take your house, they can take your car, your jewellery, they'll close your bank accounts, they'll put you in prison. And if you want to live in this society, in Australia, you're not allowed to drive a car until you register it. And the registration has a fee. That fee is in Australian dollars. If you want to purchase property, there's a stamp duty. That stamp duty, you have to pay in Australian dollars. You can't buy goods and services because there's a goods and services tax of 10% on everything, well, most things, in Australia. So how are you supposed to t pay that 10% GST if you don't have any Australian dollars? That's what makes you use Australian dollars. Otherwise, we'd use something more valuable. Maybe we'd use gold or platinum. Maybe we'd use the Japanese yen, the American dollar. Maybe we'd use the British pound. We don't. We use Australian dollars here in Australia because we have to pay taxes in them. To live and operate in this society, you must somehow find Australian dollars. So, now, if there's 10 people in the room and I only spend nine cards, there will necessarily be at least one person unemployed. Maybe there'll be more. What if some people save their cards? Well, there'll be more than one person unemployed if I only spend nine in a 10-person economy. In real life, it isn't an actual guy with a big stick at the door, but it is the Australian government with its police and its court system and its tax collection agency. If you don't toe the line, then there are big consequences. So, because you can't ever leave the room without paying your tax, you're all looking for paid work, something that pays in my business card. And you can't find it, because I haven't spent anything yet. Until I spend these business cards into the economy, you can't find work that pays in these business cards. If you print your own, then you're counterfeiting. Now, I offer you all a job. Let's say that if you stay afterwards and clean up the room for 10 minutes, then you'll get one of these cards. So now you can get a card each, and there's 10 of you, 10 cards, and then you can leave. If I only spend nine cards, but there's 10 of you, there will necessarily be unemployment. There's no other way around it. No matter how well educated you become, no matter how hard you fight for a job each, if I only spend nine, but there's 10 of you, there will be unemployment. Now, you might want to save a card. That way you can eventually go on holiday uh, using your savings without having to work every single day. So that's the idea of saving, is that you save now to consume more later. So let's say you all decided to save one card. Well, when I offer jobs, I'll have to spend at least 20 cards because you'll all need one to pay the tax and one to save. And what if I only decide to spend 19 cards? There'll be unemployment. Why? Because I'm not spending enough of my currency to cover the need to pay the tax and the saving desires of the population within my economy. Is there any other possible reason why there could be unemployment? The answer is no. In Australia, the private sector has only ever been able to employ around 77% of the labour force. The private sector has never been able to fully employ the population. It's worth thinking about that the next time that you say, well, the government shouldn't be spending more to hire more people for the public service, leave it to the private sector. The private sector in Australia, on average, has only ever been able to employ about three quarters of the workforce. The rest will necessarily be unemployed unless the government deficit spends a lot more or unless it hires more people itself. Warren Mosler gave the example a few years ago. He said, in the USA, the government taxes three and a half trillion dollars and then they spend $4 trillion. So they deficit spent $500 billion, and yet there's still unemployment. What does that mean? It means they need to spend more. They haven't spent enough to cover the tax bill and the desire of the people to save money. They'll probably need to spend $5 trillion, he says, to cover everybody's savings desires. Can they afford it? Of course they can. They issue their own currency. The point is that unemployment is always and everywhere a case where the government has not spent enough of its own currency to cover the tax bill and the savings desires of the population. The answer to that is either to spend more or to tax less. That's a political choice. In this business card example, why was my guy at the door collecting taxes? Was he collecting taxes so that I could spend business, ca business cards? No, I didn't need them. Did, did I need him to collect the cards so that you'd be able to pay me? No, I had to spend them first and then collect them. It's just like at a stadium. 
they have to issue you the ticket to get into the stadium first, and then they collect the ticket afterwards. It would be backwards to do it the other way around. When you go to the theatre, they have to issue you with a theatre ticket before they take it off you at the door. So every politician that says, we have to tax first and then we spend, they have it backwards. They have to spend first and then tax. So with these business cards, I pay you enough to save, and if I was the government, I would then borrow back your savings. That's what government-issued bonds are. It is the government borrowing back its own IOU, which is ridiculous. Why do they do it? Historical inertia. They do it because it's a relic of the gold standard. Back when there was a gold standard, the, the initial cards did have gold on the back of them. <laughs> and th they had a store of gold that they needed to defend. If everybody handed in their cash and wanted it converted immediately into gold, they might run out of gold in the vault. So in order to disincentivize people from spending all their cash at once, they would say, well, we'll give you an interest payment on your banknote. We'll replace your banknote. You give me the banknote and I'll give you a, a certificate that says at the end of 10 years, I'll pay 10% interest on your banknote. And that way they could defend their gold reserve. Nowadays, since 1971, the, the world is not on a gold standard. They don't have a gold reserve to defend, so they, they don't need to issue government bonds, but they like to do it as a form of corporate welfare. Indeed, imagine being able to invest money in an interest-bearing asset at zero risk. It's not bad, right? Well, you can. With government bonds, there's no chance of the government ever going broke. You could put $100 into a, your $100 banknote, transfer it for a certificate, that is a government-issued treasury bond, and then, at the end of the maturity period, you'll get that back with interest. Your cash in your wallet doesn't earn any interest, but if you transfer your cash into a savings security, into a government-issued bond, then you'll get some interest on it. So the truth is that they don't need it, but uh, the government, that is, they don't need to issue bonds. They don't need to borrow back their own currency in order to spend. So we need to look at both sides of a transaction. One person's spending is another person's income, one person's income is another person's spending. When you deposit money into a bank account, that deposit counts as your asset, but it is also the bank's liability. So we're looking at both sides of a transaction here. Eventually, the bank will have to give back your deposit, and that's why it's their liability. And it's your asset because eventually you'll get it back. So if a global economy consisted of only two nations, nation A and nation B, if nation A runs a trade deficit, that means that necessarily nation B must be running a trade surplus. One person's spending is another person's income. It's an accounting identity. So if you look up sectoral balances, this was something, uh, I guess, developed by the economist Wynne Godley, you will see sectoral balances tells us that it all has to net to zero. The, the government sector surplus is the non-government sector deficit. So when the government runs a deficit, that is the private sector and the foreign sector's surplus. And when the government runs a surplus, they're necessarily taking away the savings of the non-government sector. Always and everywhere, dollar for dollar. It's an accounting identity. So let's quickly clarify the government deficit. If the Commonwealth government spends a billion dollars, but only takes back $900 million at the end of the year in taxes, then they're running a $100 million deficit. Alternatively, let's look at it the other way around. If the government spends a billion dollars and takes back $1.1 billion in tax revenue, they are running a $100 million surplus. And if they spend a billion dollars and take back a billion dollars at the end of the year in tax revenue, their budget is balanced. They are running a balanced budget. We are told that a government deficit is bad and a government surplus is good, but the opposite is true. Unless you're running a foreign sector trade surplus, if the government keeps taking from you more than they're giving back to you, you'll eventually run out of money. Every time the Australian government runs a budget surplus, they are extracting money from the non-government sector. It's no coincidence that during the Clinton administration in the US and during the Howard and Costello years here in Australia, Whilst the governments were running government surpluses, so too was the private sector, the non-government sector, taking on much more private household and private business debt. That's a problem, because the government can never run out of money, whereas the private sector can very quickly run out of money. And if the private sector takes on lots and lots of debt that 
it eventually has to pay back with interest payments, very quickly it will go insolvent. Whereas a national government, as Alan Greenspan said, can never go insolvent. Over the years, the deficits accumulate into the national debt. And there's also this so-called government borrowing, which takes place when the government issues bonds. These are sometimes called Australian government bonds, AGBs. They're sometimes called ex exchange-traded treasury bonds. And they're sometimes called Co Commonwealth Government Securities, CGSs. The ridiculous thing, of course, is that the government issues these things in the first place at all. They don't, they don't have to. Why would they need to borrow back something that they issue? But in fact, the private consumer has such an appetite for these Commonwealth Government bonds that even when the Howard Costello government was running a surplus, they still issued them. If we were to completely eliminate the national debt, there would be no more currency in circulation because the, the currency is a liability of the currency issuer. If we eliminated the national debt, we would have to give back all of the Australian dollar banknotes. You can see on our banknote, for instance, here's a $5 note, that it's signed by the Secretary to the Treasury and it's also signed by the Governor of the Reserve Bank. Both of these institutions, both the RBA and the Treasury, have been given their authority by decree of the Australian Government. You'll notice too that it says on this note, this Australian note is legal tender throughout Australia and its territories. What does the word legal tender mean? Legal tender means that it must be accepted if it is offered in payment of a debt. So this banknote is an IOU, and this banknote comprises a very small part of the Australian national debt. So if the government was to completely eliminate their debt, we would all have to give back our banknotes. You can see that more often than not, debt and deficit are really very important for the, the functioning of a monetary economy. If you want a payment clearing system, it's very important that there is some currency with which to trade. For the longest time, Australia didn't worry about its national debt and deficit. Of course it didn't, because that was what was helping us grow our economy, was by the government issuing more money so that the private sector could, could save. In fact, we know that the government didn't really care about the debt and deficit because for 38 years they ran a consecutive government deficit. All the way from 1949 to 1987, they never balanced their budget. And the Australian government has only, in history, balanced its budget or run a surplus about one year in every four. Now, there are some nations, like Norway, for instance, that you'll notice run consistent trade surplus. Why do they run a, a very consecutive trade surplus? Well, a place like Norway has a massive trade surplus. So all of this money is pouring into their economy. They've already got the very best healthcare system in the world. They've got the best education. They've got um, a very long life expectancy. They've got terrific public transport. They've got all of the things that they could possibly need and very low unemployment. So if you keep piling more money into that economy, there will be inflation because somebody will go to a shop with $100,000 and say, I'd like to buy this Mars bar and... The, the production of Mars bars will be at maximum capacity. There are no more Mars bars that they can produce. Therefore, if people have more money, too much money chasing too few goods, that creates inflation. So of course Norway wants to be running a, a, a government surplus. It wants to do that in order to take away private sector spending capacity. They want to limit that because inflation can occur when there are too many dollars chasing too few goods, when consumer demand is outstripping the productive capacity of the economy. So, for instance, when Weimar Germany uh, had lost half of its factories, it had lost Alsace-Lorraine, it had lost the Ruhr, these major uh, industrial producing regions, and also it had to pay massive reparations in a foreign currency. Uh, of course, there was inflation because they kept, um, they kept converting their currency, which was not backed up by any real goods and services. They kept converting it into uh, foreign currencies, very quickly there was hyperinflation. Similarly in Zimbabwe when Mugabe redistributed what was previously productive agricultural land to military friends of his, production diminished by some 60%. Imagine if a friend of mine <laughs> confiscated somebody's farmland and gave me a thousand acres of farmland tomorrow. Terrific, I'd sit on the porch, I'd watch the sun go down, I'd have a lovely time on my brand new thousand acres, but I don't know how to farm. And so if that thousand acres had been producing 10,000 tonnes of crops for export last year, this year, now that you've given it to me and I have no idea how to farm, it's going to produce nothing. For a nation like Zimbabwe, which was formerly the breadbasket of Africa, when Mugabe redistributed land to his friends who were just in the military, they had no idea how to farm, he redistributed what was productive farmland into, uh, 
he redistributed it to people who had no idea how to farm. And so, of course, exports dropped significantly. At the same time, they were still issuing more money and they were converting that money. Mostly, they were friends of Mugabe were taking it offshore, converting it into US dollars. Very quickly, people started to say, what is the value of this currency anyway? They're not producing anything. There's nothing on the back of this card, as it were. And so, of course, there was hyperinflation. Now, in Australia, we do not face that same risk. Australian businesses and households, when they start spending more money, our producers have the capacity to increase production to match that demand. Right now, our capacity utilisation is at about 80%. 80%. That is, imagine if you have five factories and, and five trucks, and you just leave one, of the, you leave one of the factories and one of the trucks sitting idle. Until we employ that truck and employ that factory and employ all of the underutilised labour, there will be no hyperinflation episode. There will be no consistent inflation episode. 